All right, history fans, welcome to another exciting lecture in the course. And here today we begin the first of two lectures examining cultural trends in America in the early 1800s, the early 19th century. In recent lectures, we talked about political trends in this period, the Jacksonian era. We talked some time ago about economic trends in this period, industrialization in the north, the rise of the cotton kingdom in the south. More recently, we talked about the antebellum reform era, how this is a period of great enthusiasm for reform. But here today, we begin the first of two lectures focusing in on cultural expressions in this period of the early 1800s. So we are in that same time period, the early 19th century, a period that hopefully at this point you can see as really remarkable in American history with so many key developments in this period. And here we add to that with a study of cultural trends in this period. In this first lecture, examining the relationship between that era and cultural expressions, we will focus on what we may describe as high culture, literature, philosophy, art. And then in our second lecture on culture in this period, we'll focus on mass and popular culture. But we begin our project here of an examination of American cultural trends in the early 19th century with this first lecture on what we may describe as high culture. Here we'll talk about philosophy, art, and literature in the early 19th century. In 1837, Ralph Waldo Emerson gave a lecture titled The American Scholar in which he called for the creation of a uniquely American culture, something that would define the United States and its culture as unique, as different than other nations around the world and would reveal the American essence, the American character. American Scholar was for Emerson, a Declaration of Independence for American culture. In 1776, we signed a Declaration of Independence that sought to create a new nation. And we fought a revolutionary war to that end. In the decades that followed, we did create an independent nation with its own government. But Emerson argued we have yet to become independent from Great Britain in terms of culture. When he gave this lecture in 1837, most of the books read in the United States were written by British authors. He decried that we were still so slavishly devoted to British culture, British thinkers, British writers. And what he wanted was to declare independence from Great Britain culturally and give birth to uniquely American expressions in philosophy, art, and literature. How would we do this? Well, Emerson argued that American writers, thinkers, scholars, as exemplified in the title of this lecture, should look inward. And whatever they find in this process of introspection, this process of interrogation of the self as they go forward and think about what they believe, what they hold to be true, necessary, and just, whatever they find in that process of introspection, they should embrace, they should trust, and therefore, advance as their own answer to this question of who we are as Americans. So in previous lectures, when we've examined this period in terms of economics, politics, the reform movements of this period, the Second Great Awakening, all the topics that we've already examined in the early 1800s, I've stressed to you that all of those movements, all of those developments in politics, in the economy, exemplify individualism. As I've said many times in these lectures, individualism is the sort of common thread, common denominator, this watchword that shows up in all aspects of American life. And here it is in Emerson's call for individuals to look for the truth, look for beauty, and whatever they find in that process of a search for truth, beauty, they should embrace what they as individuals arrive at. So once again, it's very much exemplary 
of the individualism that prevails in this period now for Emerson in the process, the necessary process of defining a uniquely American culture. Let us rid our nation of the way in which we appear to be captive to British thinkers, British art, British writing, and articulate and establish a uniquely American culture that we can only arrive at if we trust ourselves, if we look inward, if we go through this process of an individual search for the truth and then embrace that truth. He said in this lecture, the American scholar, let the single man plant himself indomitably on his instincts and there abide. Well, here you get an introduction to the very florid and remarkable language of Emerson. Uh, he made a career as a lecturer and writer because he was so skilled with words. What he means here in the phrase that I have offered to you on the slide is that we should be brave, we should be bold, we should be daring to embrace what we know to be true. Embrace our individual instincts, our individual imperatives and demands in this process of expression, art, culture, in our efforts to arrive at fundamental truths that we know to be true and indicative of ourselves and with it our nation. Let the single man plant himself indomitably on his instincts and there abide. What you know to be true as an individual, you should embrace. So the American scholar, a lecture delivered by Emerson, a great American writer and thinker of the early 19th century where he was calling upon other writers, thinkers, students, scholars to indeed embrace their individual pursuit of truth and in doing so establish this Declaration of Independence for American culture. Emerson wasn't just one to call for such efforts to create a uniquely American culture. He himself contributed to that effort by being one of a number of philosophers in this period to create a uniquely American field of philosophy, transcendentalism. Emerson is one of the leading figures associated with the creation of the transcendentalist movement. And transcendentalism is not just indicative of an effort in this period to create something that is uniquely American. It's also very indicative of that notion of individualism that is at the heart of the cultural trends we'll talk about in this lecture and so much of American life. Though transcendentalism was critical of the market revolution, the industrial age, this new age of machines that seem to be so devoid of humanity and human beauty, critical of the emphasis on wealth, of going from rags to riches in the new economy. Transcendentalism, though, shares a lot with the market revolution, the emphasis on individualism, the emphasis on breaking free from the old, embracing the new, the emphasis on self-determination, because transcendentalism, the philosophy that Emerson and others helped create in this period, as its name indicates, is about transcending the dominant mainstream society and arriving at something that is true to you, the individual. Transcendentalists argue that society with its rules, its strictures, its moral codes, its traditions is designed to ensnare and limit individuals, make them conform, follow the rules, do what they're told. The goal for Emerson and others is to question authority, question the, wor the rules and strictures that you inherit when you're born into this world and decide for yourself as an individual whether those rules, those moral codes are worthy. And if they're not, you should shed those moral codes. You should refuse to abide by those rules. You should be a non-conformist, a non-compliance, uh, someone in non-compliance who is brave and bold enough to live by their own truth and by their own notions of what is right, true, and beautiful. So transcendentalism is one about individualism, and that's very much consistent with what we've seen in this period, but it's also about challenging the existing order, breaking norms, 
self-determination to determine not necessarily your income or your wealth, but what you know to be true. And so though transcendentalism was very critical of the dominant culture and certainly the economic trends of the spirit, it shares a lot with the market revolution and industrialization and universal white manhood suffrage and this idea of embracing individualism, challenging the existing order, embracing change. Transcendentalists argued that everything should be questioned, that you don't just merely follow the rules or worship that God or salute that flag because that's the way things are. That's the way things have always been. That's the way your parents and other figures of authority live their lives. Instead, you should question everything and arrive at what you know as an individual to be true. That might require you to live in a very unorthodox fashion, and we'll give some examples of the way in which transcendentalists often did live in a very unorthodox fashion. It might require you to break the law, and transcendentalists, like the abolitionists, which we talked about in a recent lecture, embraced the idea of breaking laws that they saw as pernicious, as agents of injustice, like slavery. And so transcendentalism was very much a philosophy that embraced this idea of challenging the existing order. And again, that's very consistent with other trends we have seen in this period. For them, the ultimate freedom is the ability to develop a life of your own, a life of your own making, to pursue a life that again is true to what you know to be just, true, and beautiful. The end all be all is not going from rags to riches. You might go from rags to riches, but what has really changed? Yourself, no. Your income, your wealth, your material, uh, material goods, but you're no different. You haven't improved, you haven't changed. Instead, cultivation of the self, cultivation of the mind, learning, developing a life that is true to you. For transcendentalists like Emerson, that's the ultimate pursuit of happiness. That's the ultimate self-development to arrive at a life that is true to you rather than just follow the rules, conform, congratulate yourself that you've somehow succeeded because you have more money. That's not success for a transcendentalist. Transcendentalist, is, the success comes in indeed transcending the existing order and arriving at a life that is true to you. Another aspect of transcendentalism that we need to be mindful of, as it will be key to our studies here in these lectures on culture, is that the transcendentalists placed a great emphasis on emotion. And that's true to broader trends in this period. The early 19th century, the period that we've been examining for some time, is known as the Romantic period, both in the United States and in many parts of Europe. Now, when I say romantic, I don't mean red roses and berry white, not that sense of romance. Uh, romant the Romantic period was a period in Western culture, art, literature that emphasized emotion, feelings. It was a conscious rejection of the Enlightenment. We talked about Enlightenment thinkers like John Locke earlier in the class, how in the 1700s there, uh, there was this class of thinkers uh, men like Locke, who emphasized reason, rationality. There was a scientific revolution. In the 1700s, there's a great emphasis in Western thought on using your power of reason, your rational mind to arrive at the truth. And that's why Locke, though he was to our eyes a philosopher, thought of himself as a scientist who could, through scientific means, study human behavior and arrive at fundamental truths about how to organize society. But in the 1800s, that emphasis on rationality and reason was rejected by the romantic thinkers of this period who argued that passion, emotion, is a more valid pathway to the truth than reason and rationality. They argued that reason and rationality foreclose a certain parts of a human experience that are powerful and just as important in arriving at knowledge and understanding as one's mind, passion and emotion are also ways to understand the world around you, feel connected to things that again, you may know to be true, beautiful and just. As we'll talk about 
in a moment. Transgenitalists were often uh, strong advocates of immersing oneself in nature, to be overwhelmed in awe by the beauty of nature, because when you're standing in a field and you feel the rain on your skin, when you watch a sunrise or sunset, there is a certain beauty that is revelatory, that speaks to you in a way that can arm you with insights and reveal the truth. So in addition to the emphasis on individualism, individual pursuit of the truth, challenging the existing order, transcendentalists like Emerson often emphasize this idea of emotion, passion, as gateways to the truth, as gateways to arriving at that larger plane of knowledge and significance as you transcend the limits and bonds of traditional society. Emerson began his career pursuing um, studies that would lead to a career as a minister. Originally, he planned on being a minister in the Unitarian Church, but over time, he developed a different public career as a writer, a lecturer. We began this lecture ourselves with uh, some insights that came from Emerson's lecture in 1837, The American Scholar. And Emerson was much in demand as a public speaker because of his challenging ideas, but also, of course, his evocative and beautiful language. Uh, this is the early 1800s. There's no television, no radio, no internet, none of the things that amuse and delight us today. All these TV shows you guys like to watch, like Dancing with the Idiots and America's Got Herpes, all these shows you guys are into. So believe it or not, in the early 1800s, one form of entertainment was to go and watch a lecture. I know, strange, right? And Emerson was one of the more popular lecturers because of, again, the ideas he offered and the way in which he expressed them. He began a career as a professor, a lecturer, a writer, and abandoned his pursuit of a career as a minister. At various times, he taught at Harvard and Yale. He founded the Transcendentalist Club in Concord, Massachusetts, and that's why the Transcendentalists have the name they have. Uh, it comes from the name of the club that they founded, where like-minded individuals like Emerson, other writers, thinkers of the New England era area could come together and share their thoughts uh, give lectures emerson was very skilled in language that's what makes his um ideas live on in many ways and he remains a very vital figure in western thought uh students are assigned emerson to this day in the 21st century in part because of his vivid language and imagery as we got a taste of in the first slide. And of course, it helped make him very successful with a long career as a writer and lecturer. He argued throughout his career as a transcendentalist that the truth is out there. This too makes Emerson very similar to other ideas and figures that we've encountered in the class, albeit figures that Emerson would be very critical of. Emerson was very critical of organized religion and certainly critical of the mass religious expressions of the Second Great Awakening. He saw them as manipulative, uh, as, again, ways of whipping up the masses into a false commitment to the truth. Emerson was very critical of someone like Charles Finney, who we talked about in our lecture on antebellum reform and the Second Great Awakening, because he saw him as a charlatan, as a manipulator, as someone who falsely convinced you that you knew God or knew the truth. For Emerson, again, the truth can't be found in a tent revival. It can't be found in a mass meeting. It has to be found through this process of individual introspection. But one thing that Emerson had in common with Finney was they both argued that anyone can know the truth. Finney argued that God will reveal himself, and so he'd have you dance to the Holy Roller Band, and your body would start shaking and quaking. And for Finney, that was proof that this common farmer, laborer, shopkeeper could receive and know God. Emerson would look at that as, again, uh, flim-flam, nonsense, a manipulation. 
But Emerson also believed, like Finney, but in a different way, that the truth is accessible. The truth is accessible to anyone who dares to look for it. That it's out there. That it's inside you. You just have to be brave and bold to look for it and not accept what is handed to you. Not accept the conventional ways of thinking, the conventional wisdom. Instead, you have to be willing to again look inward and embrace what you find. For Emerson, that's too uncomfortable. That's too difficult for most people. And so they just go along. They follow the rules. They worship the God they're told to worship and salute the flag slavishly, mindlessly. Emerson said, most people live these lives that are not of their own making, where they're simply following the rules, filling in the spaces on the paint by number life that has been handed to them. The truly individual people are the ones who are willing to look inward, challenge the existing order, and arrive at, again, a fundamental truth that is accessible, a truth that's out there, it's knowable, if you're willing to go through that difficult and cumbersome and often challenging process of introspection. So. Emerson, like most of the transcendentalists, very critical of the mass culture that we've already talked about and we'll talk about in our next lecture on cultural expressions in this period, but there's a lot of overlap. It's, uh, again, a way for you as a student of this period to see lots of connections and threads that you can weave together. There's this connection between the Second Great Awakening, the mass religious expression of this period, and the ideas of Emerson. They both believed in an accessible, obtainable, knowable truth. For Charles Grandison Finney, it was about coming together, dancing, embracing, and ultimately receiving God through that revelation. But for Emerson, it was about being brave and bold and looking inward and there arriving at the truth. Related to this was Emerson's critique of the dominant society, its crass materialism, its worship of objects. It is an age of the rags to riches mythology. It is an age of the invention of machines that make individuals wealthy as they tap into the energies and possibilities of this age. But for Emerson, that's just stuff. A machine is just a machine. It has no inherent beauty, truth. Emerson was very critical of an age of aggression, wars against Native Americans, the U.S.-Mexican War that raged on in the 1840s that many transcendentalists were critical of, not only because of their rejection of mindless butchery and savagery, but of course the ways in which that war, as we'll soon talk about, was interpreted as a power grab by slaveholders. And the transcendentalists were often abolitionists as they saw Slavery as the ultimate example of denying people individual will and control over their lives. Emerson was very critical of the Second Great Awakening and its ways of encouraging people to be slavishly devoted to a mass religious experience. So Emerson is both a product of his age, an age of individualism, an age <clears throat> that embraced change, an age where new ideas could spread in a much more public America, but he's also very critical of this age. His masterwork, penned in 1830, simply titled Self-Reliance. And again, we Americans, we love generic names. We love names that just tell you exactly what it is, like our country, the United States of America, or a temperance society called the Society for the Promotion of Temperance, Frugality, and Industry. So, Emerson, as part of that America tradition, uh, titled his essay on self-reliance, self-reliance, right? So I wonder what this essay is about, right? By self-reliance, Emerson doesn't mean being able to, you know, make fire out of two sticks or being able to farm in an inhospitable landscape. Not that idea of self-reliance that we might have today. Self-reliance meant relying on the self as the arbiter of truth. Relying on the self as the vector and means by which you can arrive at fundamental truths that are true to you. 
Self-reliance means being able to live in a difficult and challenging way, rejecting society, rejecting what seemed to be an empty, plastic, inauthentic society, and living instead in a brave and bold way that many might see as unconventional, unorthodox, heretical, but true to the self. He says in Self-Reliance, there's nothing so sacred as the integrity of one's own mind. What is sacred? Not a book, a Bible, not a flag with its stars and stripes, not a crucifix. Instead, what is truly sacred is the self, your mind, your heart, your soul. Emerson wanted to challenge us to make sure that those parts of our lives, what we know to be true, are indeed things that we can see as sacred, as worthy of worship, because they're ours. Emerson is often described as the thinker. Another transcendentalist is often described as the doer, and that is Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau was a young man who was drawn to Emerson and his challenging, penetrating ideas and the very beautiful and vivid language of Emerson. He studied under Emerson and then made his own contributions to this uniquely American form of thought, transcendentalism. But as I said, many who study the transcendentalists see Thoreau as someone who wanted to live out this philosophy. Emerson was a professor. He had a nice home and servants. He lived very comfortably. As much as he was critical of materialism, of wealth, he liked to live in a comfortable fashion. He liked to sleep in a comfy bed and have a warm ho home. Thoreau, though, said, if we truly believe this, if we truly believe that the truth is only possible by breaking free from the limits, the bonds, the strictures of society, then that obliges us to arrive at the truth to break away from society. And that's why Thoreau will go off and live in the woods of Walden. That's why Thoreau will go to jail for his beliefs, refusing to pay his poll tax during the U.S.-Mexican War, objecting to a war that he saw as started by a slave owner to benefit slave owners. So that's why Thoreau is often thought of the do as the doer, while Emerson was merely the thinker. His masterwork was penned while incarcerated for refusing to pay his taxes on civil disobedience. And it's a great ode to rebellion, resistance in the name of what you know to be true and righteous. Thoreau was a transcendentalist and an abolitionist. He saw slavery not just as evil, but as the antithesis of all that he believed in. He believed in this idea that all individuals should be in charge of their lives. All individuals should be free to pursue cultivation of the self and arrive at fundamental truths. And when you enslave people, you deny them that. Not just the ability to earn wages for their labor, but the very control of their lives. And so, as we'll talk about in a very, very soon to come lecture, in 1840, Six, the United States goes to war with Mexico. And Thoreau was one of the many prominent critics of that war because he argued this is a war, an aggressive action against the nation of Mexico at the behest of a slaveholder, President Polk, for the interest of slaveholders. And so during the war, he refused to pay his tax. And for that, he would be incarcerated. And in his jail cell, he wrote this impassioned essay Supporting such action, the idea of civil disobedience is when you are confronted with an unjust law, it is incumbent upon you to break that law. You don't say, well, golly gee whiz, it's the law, I better follow the rules. No. When the tax collector knocks on your door and says, uh, Mr. Thoreau, we need you to pay your tax, tax money that's going to go and support a government that's perpetuating a war that you find immoral, you don't just reach in your pocket and say, well, it's the law, you're here to get the taxes. You say, hell no, even if it means going to jail. Another example of Thoreau as the doer, as a man who was willing to live out the transcendentalist philosophy, he argued that in order to know his true self, he had to 
immerse himself as an individual in nature and divorce himself from the dominant society. So in 1845, he went and lived for months in a shack in the woods near Walden Pond, and then later wrote about his experiences in a book simply titled Walden, which is one of the great texts of the transcendentalist tradition and also one of the great examples of nature writing in American history. Uh, we're well before what we may describe as the modern environmentalist movement, but many who later became part of that movement in the late 19th and 20th century were inspired by Walden, Muir, and then others who will form the beginning of the conservationist movement in the late 19th or 20th century, later environmentalists of the 1960s and 1970s read Walden and saw it as very much consistent with their goals in those environmentalist efforts because it's such an expression of the love of nature and preserving that beauty. Walden is in some part the diary of a guy all alone and it reads in many ways like a guy who's pretty lonely um, and desperate for some form of expression as he tells you about his walks in the woods and his observations of uh, woodpeckers and the like. But also a great deal of Walden is about what happens when you cut yourself off from the world and you only have yourself. He says in Walden, Thoreau writes, in order to understand myself, I had to go into the woods. Meaning that I would never know who I truly am if I stay within society. Because inevitably, when you're in society, you're a product of that society. You change yourself to fit in, to follow the rules, to get along with others, to not be seen as a weirdo or a threat. This is the challenge of Thoreau and Transcendentalist to us. I mean, think about your life. Think about the clothes you're wearing right now, what you had for breakfast, what you'll do later today, what you plan on doing next week. You know, we Americans, we are conditioned because of our history and culture to think of ourselves as individuals who make choices about all these issues, what we wear, what we eat, what we plan to do. But so much of your life whether it's in the 24-hour span of a day or the span of your lifetime, is not a product of you. It's a product of the society you were born into, the rules that you learned, the things that you were urged to value. And that was the whole project here for Thoreau. What if I didn't have that society? What if I was just alone in the woods? Then I would know my true self. Again, Walden is a great ode to nature. It's a great example of nature writing, a long tradition in American culture and society. It's very exemplary of the Romantic period where Thoreau is writing in very rhapsodic ways about the beauty of the natural world and the way it is so revelatory, its beauty, its awe inspiring him. Thoreau, like so many of the transcendentalists, were critics of a machine age of steamboats and railroads and cotton gins. For him, those were just mere machines. They're not valuable. They're not remarkable. There's nothing positive there. In the early 19th century, Americans were encouraged to embrace machines, technology, as inherently good. That if something is new, if something is uh, a new invention or a new means of transportation or production, it is inherently good. I mean, we have this idea today that technology is an inherent good, that anything new is better, right? That's why you got to throw your old iPhone in the ocean and buy the latest one immediately, right? Because you want to be left behind, you got to have the latest thing, right? We have been conditioned since the early 19th century when you have this first wave of technological change that anything new is better, that machines are constantly improving our lives, right? How often have we fallen for that bullshit, right? When TV, when computers were first marketed in the 1980s as things you would actually have in your house, personal computers. I mean, we say PC and we don't really think about it, but it stands for personal computer, meaning not the computer that everyone uses in the office, but your own personal computer. When they were marketed in the 1980s, they were marketed as time-saving devices. You know, if you have a computer in your house, you'll have so much time, it's gonna do all this work for you. We know that's nonsense, right? They're the great time sucks. There's all this effort now to find ways to get away from those phones, those tablets that take up our lives. And yet, 
we constantly believe that they will improve our lives, that they will make things easier, that they will save us time. Thoreau was sort of the first to call bullshit on this and say, no, they're just metal objects. They have no inherent value and they certainly don't improve our lives. In many ways, they stymie and limit our true selves from blossoming. Thoreau, man who wanted to live simply, austerely, who was willing to go and wipe his butt with leaves in the woods for months on end, very critical of an American era of the market revolution, the industrial revolution that prized wealth, materialism, that saw success as, again, going from rags to riches. That's not change. That's not success for Thoreau, Emerson, the transcendentalist. It doesn't really change who you are. In fact, it retards and limits your ability to change who you are because you've fallen in line with what society values. You know, today in America, we have this idea that the term success is synonymous with wealth, right? If you say someone is successful, what are you saying about that person? They're rich, as if there's no other way to be successful. Why have we lost different ways of valuing human development? Why have we lost different meanings of success? You know, being a good parent, being a good friend, being happy. If you're a happy individual, someone who is, you know, baseline happy throughout the day, I mean, anyone would be happy for a moment, right? You know, have, take a toke, have an orgasm, you'll be happy for a little while. But these people you encounter who are consistently happy, they deserve success. They deserve celebration as successful because despite the misery and grimness that surrounds us, they found ways to be happy in their lives. But that's not how we define success in the 21st century. There's only one form of success that Americans recognize, wealth. Thoreau, here in the 19th century, was trying to see a, urge us to see a different notion of success, one that means that you don't have stuff, but you have your true self. A true self that you and you alone can arrive at, that you and you alone must embark to find. Look inward, challenge the existing order, go off and live in the woods if necessary, and then, and only then, will you know true freedom, truth, then and only then will you be your true self. Joining Emerson and Thoreau as key architects and contributors to the transcendentalist field of thought, Margaret Fuller. Margaret Fuller combines a couple of threads that we've now introduced here at this point in our study of American history, feminism and transcendentalism. For her, the two were very complementary, two sides of the same coin. Feminism, as we learned about in recent lecture, is developing in the early 19th century, this effort by many American women Dorothea Dix, uh, the Grimke sisters, the uh, delegates to the Seneca Falls Convention, arguing for the emancipation of women, that they should be free from the limits imposed upon them. They should be able to vote. They should be able to pursue an education, a career. Um, that's the feminist ethos and spirit of the early 19th century. And it's very much compatible with Transcendentalism, which is about challenging the existing order, the cultivation and development of individuals. And so Margaret Fuller was both a feminist and a transcendentalist because for her, the two worked very, very well. She was a writer and thinker. Uh, she edited a newspaper, The Dial, went on to edit the New York Tribune. And then uh, in 1845, published a book that stands as her magnum opus, her masterwork, Woman in the 19th Century, which is both, again, a feminist document and part of the transcendentalist tradition. She argues in this book that women should be free to pursue every liberty and possibility. There should be no limits on women imposed by society with its gender ideologies. Remember, as we talked about, this is the period where the separate spheres doctrine is advanced as the ideal, that women should be confined to the familial, the private realm, the public and political realm is the realm for men. That's an imposition. That's a limit. And one that Fuller, as both a feminist and transcendentalist, sought to shatter. She said, no, women, 
should be able to pursue a career and education, a life of their own making. They should be able to be writers and thinkers with the same opportunities for men. And in that sense, again, she harnessed the insights that come from transcendentalism with feminism. Sadly, tragically, Margaret Fuller's contribution to American culture is a brief one, as she would die at a young age. Uh, she believed that she would never find here in the United States an American man who would truly treat her as an equal. She believed that even the most woke, we might say, American man was still polluted by American culture, patriarchy, and therefore could never see her as his equal. And so instead, she married an Italian man who she believed was more inclined towards um, this notion of gender equality. And they got married, and during their honeymoon, they were killed in a shipwreck in the Mediterranean Sea. So Margaret Fuller uh, tragically died in this shipwreck soon after marrying. And with that, we all lost the greater contribution she likely would have made to these two, to these two traditions, active in America in this period, feminism and transcendentalism. So transcendentalism, a good example of a cultural development in this period that is uniquely American. Transcendentalism is uniquely American. It is a uniquely American philosophical school, part of what Emerson saw as our declaration of cultural independence. And it's also very indicative of so many elements of American life in this period. Though it was critical of the Second Great Awakening, the market revolution, it shares with it the emphasis on individualism. At the same time, there is developing in American culture and society what we may describe as a literary independence. Because also in the early 1800s, American literature is developing in a way that seems to express a uniquely American experience. Remember Emerson in his lecture, the American scholar said we should now be independent of British culture and society. In the early 1800s, most novels published and written or read in the United States were British. They were British in their origins, written by British writers. This was what was considered literature, high art of the written word. These novels were set in Great Britain. They dealt with British history or British society. They were set in a very different world than that of the United States. But beginning in the 1820s and 1830s, during this time of dramatic change, you start to see the emergence of what we might argue is a uniquely American voice in literature. And a key figure associated with that was James Fenimore Cooper, who began his career as a writer, sort of mimicking uh, British novels. And many of his early novels were set in Great Britain, they uh, very much uh, evidenced uh, British culture, but he began to experiment with stories that are set in the United States and connect with uniquely American themes. And so his career really, again, exemplifies the shift away from British literary traditions to a uniquely American voice. Cooper wrote a series of novels known as the Leatherstocking Tales, all of which centered on his protagonist's main character, Natty Bumpo. Natty Bumpo sort of emerges as the first all-American man, sort of the first literary figure to exemplify the American experience. Leatherstocking Tales, the most famous of which is The Last of the Mohicans, so you may be familiar with that novel because it's been turned into so many movies. Last of the Mohicans has been made into a film since the silent era. And now there are more recent examples, uh, cartoons even by Disney. Uh, so you're probably familiar with that Leatherstocking tale. These novels uh, are all about the West, the frontier. That's what makes, in some ways, Cooper's um, novels uniquely American. They're about this confrontation between white settlers, white frontiersmen like Natty Bumpo, 
and Native Americans. They're about this transition. Now, in lectures to come, we'll soon talk about westward expansion. It's another one of the major developments in this period. It's one of those uh, common denominators in American history of the early 19th century that America is expanding westward. We've already gotten a flavor of that a little bit with the market revolution, the cotton kingdom. Well, there's a lot more to come. So there's a period where Americans are expanding westward, railroads, canals opening up the west, the market revolution, the westward sprawl of commercial farming, where there's this great ardor for expanding westward to secure more land for the cultivation of cotton. It's a period where we're evicting Native Americans out of the West to make way for whites to own land with Indian removal. So we already have under our fingernails already in our mental orbit some good evidence of westward expansion and there's more to come. And that's what Cooper wrote about. He wrote about how the West was in this transition where whites were appropriating land, warring against Native Americans. Uh, the last of the Mohicans is about the decline of Native American tribe as they face this onslaught. And so Cooper's novels, The Leather Stocking Tales, are about something unique to the United States and its history in the early 19th century. They're not set in Great Britain. They're not about British history and culture. They're about a unique American experience, the experience of the frontier. The experience of a clash between white America and the traditions of Native Americans. And for Cooper, that story is a sad one, a tragic one, one tinged with loss. So many of the writers and philosophers were encountering this lecture were very critical of their age. And that's sort of the role of philosophers and thinkers. They're cranks. They're people who are um, observers and critics of the age in which they live. Um, they're not people who say, hey, everything's great. Wow, this is wonderful. Uh, you get enough of that cheerleading in American society and culture. There's instead a necessary for role for people to say, wait a minute, what the hell are we doing? That's sort of the role of the philosopher, the thinker, the writer, to hold a mirror up and challenge us. And that's what Cooper did. He wrote about the frontier, but he didn't do so in a John Wayne type way of the a uh, noble, intrepid frontiersman marching westward, a story of success, the bullshit you get at Frontierland and Disneyland. His story, The Frontier, was one of loss, of a regrettable change, an older order slipping away, and a new order prevailing that was vacuous, empty, a new order of machines and railroads and profit. Cooper expressed a sense of misgiving about westward expansion, and it's related to his overall conservative ethic. He lamented the changes in the West because he didn't like change. He had a conservative sensibility. He supported slavery. He believed in this idea that whites are superior to blacks. The conservative argument, <coughs> excuse me, we encountered in our lecture on the antebellum South, the idea that things are the way they are for a reason and efforts to change that are noxious and corrosive. He opposed the political changes of his period, universal white manhood suffrage. He believed in the idea that no, only property owners should vote because they are superior. We talked in that lecture on um, universal white manhood suffrage about the questioning, the criticism and the idea that owning land somehow makes you better or superior. And therefore we should confine voting rights to those who own land. Cooper believed in that idea that if you own land, you are inherently superior. Some are better than others. He believed in hierarchy and therefore he opposed this idea of granting poor men the right to vote. Uh, he's very suspicious of mass movements, whether they are those of the Jacksonian political style or the Second Great Awakening. He was very critical of the masses, the great unwashed. He believed in elites in a way that's very consistent with Hamilton and other figures we saw earlier. He said in one of his uh, writings, not his novel, but his own writings, that America in this period of the 1820s and 1830s was becoming a country with no principles but party. And we talked about the way in which Americans are encouraged to uh, define themselves through partisan politics and the new age of Democrats versus Whigs and an age where they are encouraged to have this personal investment 
in candidates like Jackson. No God but money. Well, that's, uh, again, one of the critiques we saw with transcendentalism, that America had this very slavish devotion to wealth and materialism, but in doing so lost what is truly meaningful. A country without taste, sentiment, breeding, there you go, that idea of elites, some superior to others, or knowledge. So Cooper was a crank. He was very critical of the America in which he lived. And so later, a lot of his novels, when they're turned into movies, do sort of seem like a Hollywood Western, where the story in a frontier land sort of way is about the noble, white intruder marching westward, spreading civilization and progress, but that's not how Cooper saw the story that he saw at the heart of America, the frontier. He saw it as one that was a regrettable change where an older traditional order was slipping away and replaced by the clattering of machines. So Cooper's novels represent again this literary independence, a uniquely American form of writing emerging in this period. And they're very critical of the age that Cooper lived within, speaking to this uniquely American experience of the frontier, but doing so with the critical edge we've expressed here. Another writer who emerges in this period as one defining a certain sense of Americana, an American essence, Washington Irving, who wrote a number of tales in the 1820s and 1830s that we still teach to our children, that are our to this day seen as indicative of an American essence or character. Story of Rip Van Winkle, who among us as a child did not encounter that story in some fashion. Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Ichabod Crane, right? Every Halloween that story circulates. We still make that story into a movie, you know, starring Johnny Depp and the like. So uh, Irving's writings, live on. Irving's writings continue to be seen as indicative of a certain American character, he along with Cooper, part of this literary independence. You know, we tend to think of uh, Rip Van Winkle as kind of a cute little kid story about a man who falls asleep under a tree and grows a long beard. That's really how it has been distilled down over the generations. But the initial story was about revolution and change. It was about a man, Rip Van Winkle, who falls asleep under a tree just before 1776, just before the American Revolution begins. And then he wakes up much later after the revolution, after the revolution has proven to be successful and when there's this new fangled thing called the United States. So it's a story of a man who sleeps through a revolution and has to wake up in a very different age. Well, uh, it served therefore, penned in uh, 1820, as a metaphor for the revolutions after the revolution, the revolutions that we've now talked about, the market revolution, the transportation revolution. So um, though it was set in the late 1700s, it was really about the early 1800s. What if you fell asleep in 1815 and woke up in 1835? You'd live in a very different America, an America of canals, railroads, cities, immigrants, all the changes we've described and enunciated in this era. Irving himself had a Rip Van Winkle-like experience because he went and lived in Europe for some time, and then he came back to an America that had been remade. He had that experience that I just described of leaving and then coming back and discovering convulsive revolutionary change. He didn't fall asleep under a tree and grow a long beard, but he went and lived in Europe for some time. And then he came back to an America he didn't recognize because of the remarkable and very fast paced changes of this period. So the writings of Irving, like that of Cooper, are all about change. They're all about what is often a troubling and dislocating experience of having to wake up and see dramatic change. And like the writings of Cooper, They lament that change. They lament the loss of an older order, a meaning and structure that now seem to have dissolved into a new age where the only constant is change, where meaning seems to be elusive because so much is subject to rapid and remarkable change. You have 
in this period of the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, the emergence of a uniquely American voice, whether it is Cooper and the frontier, Irving and his tales of life in America amidst revolutionary change. And with it comes a uniquely American form of literature, increasing publication of American writers. Also in this period, you have Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, later Herman Melville, writers that, again, we learn about in school. You're still assigned in your American literature classes that we teach because they seem to indic ind indicate a certain American essence that begins here with Irving and Cooper, part of the way in which there's this emerging American self expressed through the cultural trends that we've described so far, philosophy, transcendentalism, now literature, and also in this period through art. We wrap up this first lecture examining American culture with a discussion of a uniquely American form of painting that develops in this period. Again, our first lecture on American culture, this one is dedicated to what we might describe as high culture, philosophy, art, painting. Our next lecture, we'll get down in the muck of the culture of the masses, pop culture. But let's wrap up this lecture by talking about painting. And I will only talk about painting for a little while because talking about painting is like dancing about architecture. It sort of misses the point. It's a visual medium. So in a moment, we'll actually look at painting and that will probably be much more helpful than what I'll say in this slide. But the school, the group of painters who emerge in this period as creators of a uniquely American form of painting are known as the Hudson River School or Hudson River Valley School. School, not actually in a building where you go and learn, but school here to describe a group of, in this case, uh, painters who often live close to each other in the Hudson River Valley in an area that had been transformed by the Erie Canal, a place that was really alive with change near the burned over district where religious wildfires spawning Oneida and the LDS church would flare. So again, we're talking about an America that's alive with change. And in this particular part of America, the Hudson River Valley, there within would develop this group of painters who create these uniquely American visions. American painters that are engaged with this time of change and like the writers and philosophers we've encountered in this lecture, engage with that change with a sense of misgiving loss sense that an old order was slipping away and that the new order, a new order of machines and canals and railroads was troubling. In a moment, we'll take a look at the paintings, a few that I've selected here from the Hudson River School, and you'll see they often focused on a pre-industrial way of living. They're usually devoid of railroad locomotives or clattering factories. They are odes to nature, very consistent with Walden and elements of the Transcendentalist school. As these painters focus not on the new, not on the material, not on the, again, noisy machinery of this age, but instead focused on mountains and sunrises and things that were increasingly being eclipsed and neglected in an America that so prized new technology. So there's a lot here that overlaps with transcendentalism and the writings of Cooper and Irving. You have in this period, uh, the emergence of leading figures in American art who are painting images of America, who are through their visuality communicating a uniquely American experience alongside the writings of philosophers and novelists Thomas Cole, Frederick Church, Asher Duran. Uh, these names may not be familiar to you unless you've taken a class on American art. And then in such a class, you would learn about these painters in the Hudson River School, much like you would in an American literature class, learn about Fenimore Cooper or Nathaniel Hawthorne as exemplary, exemplary of American writing traditions. 
Hudson River School emerges in the same period, begin 1820s, 1830s, flourishes through the 19th century, paints a number of masterpieces that hang in galleries and are often celebrated as indicative of an American school of art, an American field of expression de developing in this period. Here's one of the masterworks of Thomas Cole, painted in 1845, the midpoint of the 19th century. But if you look at this painting, there's no indication that it was painted in 1845. It looks like it could be set in 1645. It's a roughly hewn cabin. Um, no markers of modernity, no machines, no steamboats, no factories belching smoke. Of course, the thing that you're most struck by when you look at this painting is the emphasis on nature. August skies, formidable mountains, beautiful trees. It's again very much in line with the nature emphasis, the elements that we saw in Thoreau and come through in the novels of James Fenimore Cooper. Human beings are sort of an afterthought in this painting. They're there in the corner. They're pretty inconsequential. What's really the focus of this painting, nature, and the way in which it has that power to speak to us. George Caitlin was a painter in the Hudson River School who focused on portraits of Native Americans. And here you can see many analogies to James Fenimore Cooper and the romantic way in which he represented Native Americans in a somewhat sympathetic light, albeit still confined to a different stereotype, that of the noble savage. They're still reduced to stereotypes. They're just not the tomahawk-wielding maniacs that may have appeared in other expressions in the discourse of civilization. Here they're granted a sort of nobility in images like this, but Caitlin painted Native American chiefs in this fashion because he saw them as people being swept up by corrosive trends of this era, pushing them off the land, there's a lot of sense of loss in these images of Caitlin, how he's engaged with the trends of this period, that of westward expansion, technological change, but engaged with those trends in a way that's very critical. He doesn't see the march westward of white America as triumphant. Instead, it's displacing people that he represents here with some humanity and nobility. Our last painting, that I will torture you with here of the Hudson River School is titled The Merry Boatsman. And it's from George Caleb Bingham, another leading figure in the Hudson River School. Look at this image. Here are men floating along on a barge. As you can see, the barge is powered not by a steam engine, this is not a steamboat, but by a human being, animal power. So again, so much of the Hudson River School is an image of an older order, pre-industrial order, a romantic, enchanting, appealing image of an America before steamboats and locomotives and factories and all the other forms of change that for the Hudson River School and many of the other writers and thinkers we've encountered in this lecture, a, a change that's not admirable, not good, not positive. Just because things are changing doesn't mean they're better. Here he paints this beautiful image of simplicity, of quiet. These men aren't in a hurry. They're not rushing to get their crops to market. They're not rushing to seize the day and profit. They're content to lazily float down a river in America that was increasingly slipping away in the era of Bingham. So in this lecture, we began with the American scholar the effort of Emerson to urge writers, thinkers, artists of this age to break free from British traditions, create something uniquely American. In the forms of expression that we have seen develop in this period, again, you have individualism, transcendentalism, arguing all individuals must be masters of their own minds and arrive at their own truths. Be self-reliant. In the uniquely American expressions of this period, you have this engagement with 
trends of this age, but often in a critical fashion, whether it is Thoreau going off and living in Walden or Cooper's novels critiquing the loss of Native American traditions or the images we just saw from the Hudson River School. Better than think of this as a period where a uniquely American character emerges. There's no uniquely American character, no one uniquely American culture or expression. We can't distill down into an essence, this is American thought, this is American culture. America is an argument. America is a debate. America is a contest where no one voice or one tradition prevails. Rather than think of this as a period where a uniquely American way of thinking develops, we should be instead engaged with that contest where we see writers and thinkers in this period critical of America, engaged with the America that is fluid and changing in this period, albeit in a critical way, rather than think of Emerson, Thoreau, Fuller, Hudson River School, Cooper and Irving as architects of an American essence, it's probably better to see them as men and women developing fields of expression, struggling to make sense of an America that is always changing.